Hi, I'm Jonathan Whitehurst. I have 18 years experience in the Navy as a Naval Flight Officer, where I operated as a mission commander in P-3 and drone aircraft. I managed a 10-person crew, collecting various forms of data, driving real-time tactical decision-making. Now, as I'm transitioning from the military to the civilian sector, I intend to use my background of analyzing and presenting data, combined with my MBA degree, to pursue a data analytics career. Advancing my technical skills, of course, is a big part of that. The training I've received with savvy coders, including Python and SQL coding, will enable me to leverage my experience and prior education to become an effective analyst. My interest in data is in part based on the idea that almost any aspect of life can be understood more so through proper data analysis from business and operations to my own recreation and hobbies. That's why for my capstone, I chose to look further into college football, something I enjoy watching. I aim to look at transfer portal use compared to team success. And with that, I will begin my presentation. My presentation is titled Transfer Portal versus Team Success. So the transfer portal, what's it all about and why does it matter? So the one-time transfer rule was implemented in 2021 and that pertains to the transfer portal, of course. It significantly changed the way that some programs have recruited their players. Uh, this rule allows for players to transfer from one school to another just one time without having to take a year off from football. So previously you could transfer, but you'd have to take kind of a one-year penalty year where you were you know, part of the football program, but you couldn't play. Now players can go directly from one team to another in the offseason without having to take that year off. So this is a newer aspect of the game with only two years of available data. And the recency of this process also means that its impacts may not be fully understood. So we have an opportunity here for the data to provide some clarity. The specific question I attempt to answer is if an increase in the number of players recruited under this one-time transfer rule correlate with an increase in a team's success the following year. The important thing though, is how do we measure that success? Uh, it needed to be concrete and measurable. And that's why I chose points per game score uh, from one year to the next to show an improvement for a team. Um, also points against per game could be used for defensive measure but I isolated the offensive and defensive statistics and we're just focusing on offensive in this case. Also, I'm limiting this to FBS programs only. So only those teams are in that top tier of football. My expectation, uh, initially I was thinking if you're allowed to bring in teams or players from other teams that you hand pick and you know are successful on the field, of course your team's going to get better. So there should be a positive correlation. But I also saw in my... Uh, brief research getting started that Georgia had no players transfer to their team through the transfer portal and they won the national championship and are poised to uh, potentially do the same again this year. So maybe it was a negative correlation where the highest success had the least amount of transfers and the least success the most as they're fighting to catch up. Um, but in the end, I kind of determined that what I would probably see was nothing and that there's no correlation at all. My suspicion of that is simply based on the fact that college football is more complex than just one factor of how many players you bring to the transfer portal. It just couldn't be that easy. Some other factors that we faced is that this one-time transfer portal isn't really one time. It's only one time that you don't have to wait that year out. So there are some players within this data set that will not be playing next year. So their impact on the team obviously wouldn't have the same effect as a player who was falling under this one-time transfer rule. I did not exclude those players because they were a small set of the data and I did not have uh, another data set that I could compare those to and draw those players out using code. It would have to have all been done by hand and manipulated. Finally, players are recruited to and from teams through the portal. So we need to factor in both sides of that during this process. So where did I get the data? Well, first from ESPN itself, we have uh, a chart here you can see listing the teams most successful to least on points per game scored. The Tennessee Volunteers leading the way with 47.3 points per game. Um, 
I also used collegefootballdata.com. This was an excellent resource for anything data analytics in college football. I was able to get the data I needed, specifically um, the player, the number of players listed by name, by position, where they came from, where they're going um, in the transfer portal and download that as a CSV. And then I was able to use that in my data tools. And so some of those tools that I used were BS Code for utilizing Python and within that uh, Pandas library for much of what I did. And I kind of had that organized within a Jupyter Notebooks framework so I could have small snippets of uh, code that I was working with and execute one, one portion at a time. I also used uh, SQLite on DB browser to both uh, inspect data, kind of look at it, and also some simple joins and quicker processing of, of data sets within SQL. And I bounced back and forth a little between Python and SQL to get through the project. So we'll take a quick look at the coding process, both in Python programming and in SQL. I'll go straight over to VS Code now. What you see here is just a simple set of code that was able to use pandas and request libraries to read the ESPN website and then take that HTML table and download it in effect to, um, to Python coding as a data frame. Unfortunately, it came down as two separate data frames and they weren't even aligned properly. So I had to make a couple of adjustments and ultimately concatenate or join you know, uh, mesh those two back together, creating one final data frame that I could work with. I also made some adjustments to the headers to include like points.1 represented points per game. I found this a little more easy to understand. So I made that adjustment and then I deleted out those columns that I didn't need anymore. Ultimately, I was able to take that data frame and put it to a CSV. So it looked you know, very much like an Excel spreadsheet at that point. It's able to do the same thing, of course, for 2022. So now I have the 2021 and 2022 um, points per game data in a usable form. From the College Football Data website, I also downloaded um, the team list for all the FBS programs. So basically all the team names, you know, 1 to 130. Um, there were some challenges with that along the way. I'll get, that, get to that here. Um, one of the problems we faced was ESPN would call, would use one naming format, for example, Yukon Huskies, and the college football data website would say Connecticut Huskies. They're the same team, but a computer doesn't know that these are the same teams when you try and connect those data points on a team name. So um, I made some adjustments here by replacing some teams. Fortunately, there weren't a whole lot of them but I had to do a couple of uh, comparisons in SQL to find where those, uh, those differences loop or lied in the process. And here I have some SQL notes. So I'll go over to SQL and demonstrate some of that coding that I did as well. So starting here, um, there's only a few lines of code, but it's enough to take my my master names list, so all those FBS programs under a single team name, and join it with a separate table. And ultimately, I can have a full list of the teams with an ID column matching it. Um, and so then I can connect these tables together on an ID, even if the team names don't match exactly. So that was very helpful. Um, and you can see here that the number of players transferred out were tabulated. I was able to do that. Um, using code right here. We counted those players. This one shows the number of de defensive players that were transferred out in 2021 per team. And I haven't uh, eliminated some of those smaller school programs that aren't FPS yet in this table. Also important was looking at the number of teams that had no players transferred. Um, in that downloaded data set, there were no uh, they didn't include you know, Air Force Zero. They just left them off the table completely. But I did want to represent all of the teams in my in my visualization. So I identified which teams had no players. And I was able to um, do that with this code and then integrate them back in, um, in that case, using Python. So the reintegration process is right back in this, this section. Um, so as I said in the beginning, there was a little bit of back that I did in the process. 
of using both SQL and uh, Python. Excuse me. All right. So from here, we'll look at what the data shows us. Um, first glance, what are we seeing? We are seeing, you know, teams on this this left side. We have the number of players that were transferred in via the transfer portal. So on this line, Texas Tech, Arizona State, Akron, they all had nine players that were transferred in. And along the bottom, we can see that we have the difference in points scored per game from one year to the next. So for Texas Tech, they're down two points, just a little more than that per game um, from the previous year. And they did bring in quite a few players. Um, Florida State, they brought in nine players and they're eight points per game better now. Um, but really the important thing, instead of looking at specific team information, is what does the overall picture represent? And it is that there is certainly no correlation that we're seeing here. A positive correlation would show an improvement in points per game based on the number of players brought in. And that may be a flawed way of thinking about it, but that's how I went about this uh, this question. So are we seeing a correlation? No, we are not. But this, again, is just the number of players transferred to a school. We haven't considered how many players may have been transferred away from that same school. So we'll look at that now. Notice here that along your zero line, um, we have quite a few teams. But then as we go down, that'll represent more and more players that were transferred away from the team. UCF with seven out. Alabama with 11, Oregon with 11. So quite a few teams moving up this. Florida State with nine players out. Um, but again, what do we really want to focus on? Is there a correlation based on this very well-balanced mass right there in the middle? Uh, it seems that no, there's no correlation. If you gain 10 players, if you lose 10 players, um, we're not seeing it so far but when we put those two together we're looking at net transfers so both players out and players in combined will that show us anything different will we see something predictable well if you were predicting no correlation you were right we don't have one um we do have georgia southern with a number of recruits and improvement and of course we have other teams that have lost recruits and improved or uh, lost recruits and gone down in performance. It really isn't predictable. There is no correlation going on here. What are some of the challenges I faced in this process? Well, first, those naming formats that I mentioned, we've kind of gone over some of how I worked through that in changing those names within Python uh, coding or getting an ID, kind of an index going on SQL. So I can make joins along that index rather than um, trying to make sure all the names were exactly the same. I did have another challenge in that ESPN did not include Wyoming in their data set. Um, it's the last team alphabetically, so possibly ESPN somehow dropped it from their table. When I checked just prior to this recording, they were not on the website. Uh, so what I had to do is just go directly to Wyoming statistics outside of the table, just clicking on their website, and um, just hopped on Python, entered in their information using an append ready to go after that. Um, I also had to delete out James Madison University as they were an FBS program only starting in 2022. And since I'm looking 2021 to 2022, I didn't want a team that was changing so dramatically as that would change their performance measure as well. Finally, athlete position types. So let me explain, explain briefly what that's all about. Um, part of my process was taking the position types that were listed for these players in the transfer portal, defensive line, cornerback, safety, all these defensive positions, and then categorizing them as defense or quarterback, tight end, offensive tackle. All of these would be categorized as offense. But some players go by athlete and their approach is, coach, I can do whatever you need. Just put me in. I'll play offense. I'll play defense. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but that doesn't help for my data set. I'm looking for offense or defense. So what I ended up doing was just Googling their names, figuring out what position they actually play, and then putting that in. Um, because it was only 
you know, approximately 20 players and it takes about 30 seconds to do that each. It was about 10 minutes of having to look up individual names and then using SQL, I was able to um, update those players um, just using the GUI interface there. Uh, it would be more proper to download all of the data sets for all the FBS team rosters and then find these names, hoping there are, you know, two McKinsey Milton's in the program or something to that effect. And then joining tables to find where the names match up and then finding their position and then transferring it over to offense or defense respectively. Um, considering I spent 10 minutes just punching through this, um, it would have taken me more than 10 minutes to get all of that data wrangled properly. So I elected to just kind of force my way through this and move on and save that um, next level coding of myself for a different day. But those are the challenges I looked through. Some of my takeaways, well, as you saw with no correlation that the number of players, at least that statistic alone, transferred to or from a school can't predict the success for the following season. It's just not a specific enough data point. Uh, we did see some interesting things, though, that the top teams, Alabama, Georgia, Oregon, uh, Florida State, they have among the highest losses in the transfer portal, and yet they had positive performance year to year. Georgia actually went down slightly, but remains number one in the country two years running. So um, hard to say that they're not performing well. Another thing I noticed, and I didn't point out in the charts, but Army, Air Force, and Navy all had zero coming in via the transfer portal. And some brief research uh, explained why that was the case. So the name, image, and likeness deals that are um, there for players to make money um, selling merchandise and so forth at all other schools, they are not permitted at service academies. Those students are military members and employees of the federal government, and they can't have those contracts. The other thing is that the service academies don't have uh, graduate school included. So any fifth year seniors that you might see in other programs that are getting a graduate degree, they wouldn't be able to do that at a, ser at a service academy. So another disincentive. And finally, it's a four year institution. And I don't mean like all other schools are four years, but that if you've gone to school for three years and you transfer to the Naval Academy, you're going for another four years. You have to get all of that training in. So that obviously is going to discourage a lot of more senior players from going and having to start over, not to mention the likelihood of going to the NFL afterwards is quite slim when you look at the history of those players. So tough road for service academies with the transfer portal um, becoming so prominent. Finally, uh, it looks like success via the transfer portal parallels successful recruiting at the high school level. And that is to say that it's the quality of our recruits that matter most. It really doesn't matter if you get them from high school, if you get them from other college programs through the transfer portal, you bring good players to your team and you develop them, you'll do well. Um, so the quantity that I was focused on in this is less important. Throughout this uh, course and project, we were working under an agile environment. And with that, uh, utilizing JIRA and task management on the JIRA board, um, that helped us just kind of break things down into smaller tasks and, and work through our process and stay on track. Um, I did have the opportunity to be scrum master for my cohort, um, performing daily standups, looking at things we did the day before, establishing a plan of the day for what we had before us, and then, of course, identifying blockers. And with that, I'd say a big thank you to Savvy Coders, the staff, and instructors, um, because when we had blockers, they were always available. Of course, during those uh, hours of class time, but anytime we were outside of that, a quick Slack message to the group, and within five minutes, I would have you know, 30 plus years of coding experience, just ready to help, which is obviously fantastic. So thank you very much to my class, to the instructors, and thank you for watching. And that concludes my presentation.